I've always wanted to do this intro, but you know, you're never quite sure if doing this intro vocally at any given time after 1996 would have been greeted with anything other than a bit of an eye roll. But now it's a 25th anniversary. I get to do it. Guess who's coming? It's guess who's coming? It's ticket 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 ticket. Guess who's coming? It's <laughs> DJ Shadow back, 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 back again. Who is he? Just your favorite DJ savior. Yep, now that's you, how it went. You can't hear the explosion because Shadow doesn't like to hear the sound of his own voice. He's like Terminator X, speaks with his hands. But we have an opportunity right now, and a rare opportunity it is, to reflect on the legacy of, no question about it, one of the greatest albums ever made, modern music, in fact, any generation. I stand by it as a fan. You know I am, but it has traveled so far and wide that if, I think even you, who is like a naturally humble human being, can hopefully enjoy this moment based on what you created 25 years ago. You're a futurist, but we get to reflect today, Josh. Totally. I mean, I've always seen that album as a gift. Um, I've always seen, I, I as a, you know, fan of music and somebody who likes to say they study music and the history of music, I understand how unusual everything about the success of that record or the, I don't know, the just the, the entire arc of the record, it's really unusual. And so I can, I can recognize that and appreciate it sort of from a distance. But then when it comes to talking about, you know, the, the actual making of the record and some of the other stuff that goes into it and and what was it like doing X, Y, and Z. It's It occupies a different space in my head. And it's not one I visit very often. Yeah, because you moved on. I mean, and by the way, I think that it's actually a pretty overlooked fact amongst most fans of the record. I certainly took a long time to figure this out, that you had approached this from a, from a place of reduced process. It, you know, I think some people assumed like, that's how you made your music. But you actually were like, no, I'm coming in to make this record with these two or three bits of kit. And it's a very deliberate decision I'm making. Yeah. You had a, you had skills beyond that. You were, you'd used other pieces of equipment. You knew what you were doing. But you were like, this is the kind of record I want to make. So it's understandable that you would leave that behind because it was actually an experiment, right? Yeah. I mean, it, there's a lot of things I think that people maybe, and there's simple things, but and I don't expect people to spend a bunch of time thinking about things like this, because why? But, I mean, there are certain pragmatic realities to why the record is what it is. I mean, for one thing, I lived in Davis, California. Not exactly a hotbed of hip-hop activity at that time. So the prospect of me growing up, you know, I was a huge fan in the, in the 80s of hip-hop music, but I didn't know any rappers. I didn't know any MCs. I didn't know anybody who, at school who said, I'm a rapper. You know, there were a few DJs, there were a few break dancers at that time frame, but I never met anybody that declared themselves themselves an MC. You're a partner in crime, let's get into it, let's do it. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. exactly. The, my partner in crime in high school was a graffiti writer right. who did a, a lot of the artwork for our early releases and stuff. But I just never found an MC, so it was this kind of crossroads where it's like, well, okay, I could either become like, a DJ who plays weddings and plays in clubs and maybe can get on the radio, for, like mix show radio or something. That was one path. Another path was, well, I want to contribute to this art form that's given me so much. In my own kind of, um, you know, delusion, I, I thought, well, you know, maybe I have a voice to offer. Maybe um, I can contribute and amplify some of the things about the music and the culture that I feel like had gone by the wayside. And that's kind of the path that I took because I didn't really have the right flair. Like, you know, to be a, a club DJ at that time, you had to have a certain panache that it just didn't, I, you know, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't in me. And the other thing is whenever I did DJ, I was just playing these really rough tracks that I loved, but weren't dance tracks, you know, like nobody's really dancing to ultramagnetic MCs and records like that or school ED. I mean, they're, they're head nod records, and those were the records I gravitated toward. One of the things that immediately jumps out to me is just how on the cusp of new you were by creating something that was steeped in instant in the vintage. Um, and the first stop on the road is this idea of reluctance being a marketing tool. 
It's crazy now when you think about how people hold deliberately. I actually think there's a lot of artists out there that would rather be up front, but there's somebody in their ear going, no, 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 this is a great marketing tool now. Mm -hmm. Hang in the shadows, pun very much intended. Right. And you know, when you came out, your reluctance to my point became part of the gravity that drew people into this project from the name. I mean, that says that every, everything you need to know is on the side of the can. Right. right through to the artwork, to the way the videos and the granular imagery and your reluct reluctance to want to hype it, hyped it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just really hard to dissect and, and, you know, kind of amplify or look under a magnifying glass, all the little inner workings about James and Moax and the fact that I was an American debuting in England and being known in England. Um, yeah, you, you just can't, you, it's not the type of thing that you can sit down, you know, in a boardroom and go, okay, here's how we're going to do right, it. That's what yeah. I mean. It's yeah. like you stumbled into this thing yeah. and, and let's park that bit. Cause that's going to mm -hmm. work really nicely as we develop the conversation through the process of, of what happened to the record. Mm -hmm. but we got to come back to it because you were that reluctant astronaut. <laughs> you know, who suddenly got thrust into the limelight by trying to actively resist it. it. Right down to the way you made the record, which was no one was waiting for this record. No one was out there going, oh, I hear whispers in the wind that there's this DJ shadow opus coming. You tucked yourself away in the glue factory or in your apartment and you just had all the time in the world, right? Yeah. Uh, I did feel pressure though. I mean, I'm the type of person that if if there's one person in my ear being like, I believe in you. I'm excited about what you're doing. That's all I need. All I need is just one person as, I don't know if you want to say a muse, but somebody that's invested in what I'm doing. And who was that person? I initially it was Dave Funk and Klein. Um, and after he passed, it was a couple of different a &R people here and there. But I mean, hip hop changed every three months back then. And whereas what I'm, you know, when I'm doing something spacey and out there with Dave Klein and then the next day in our, our guy at Wild Pitcher Profile or whatever other hip hop label at that time, it's, it's moved on to where it's like, can't you use some more familiar stuff? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you, you should make, do, do like this, like at the time it was like Nubian crackers and records like that, where it was all familiar breaks and, and yeah. samples that people had just used. Yeah. And people were trying to push me to doing that. I was like, nah. Uh, you know, James was in my ear from 93 onward, or maybe even late 92 onward. I don't really recall now, but I delivered him a couple of singles in, in quick succession. Then I started working on the album. Now, what ended up happening was I had three or four or five songs done, and Moax was basically like, okay, stop what you're doing. We want to do another single before we do your album. And they basically ended up putting out an EP called What Does Your Soul Look Like? Yep. And I was kind of gutted by that because I was like, damn, I just spent four months and this is the best. Like, I feel like I was getting into a flow where it's like I found something. You know what I mean? I had been woodshedding and then I found something. The beginning of a complete thought. Yeah. Yeah. And, and an identity that was indelible to the music I was making. It wasn't random or generic, you know? So I reluctantly agreed. And then I was like, wow, I have to start over. And that was, so on one level, it's like, yes, I was in isolation. But again, James, I knew James was looking to me. I knew p other people within Moax and people like DJ Crush that I had toured with. Like there were people that, that I didn't want to let down. <laughs> it's interesting that you put it in those terms. You, the way you're describing it is that, you know, you felt the pressure to be a team player, but you weren't quite sure how you fit in just yet. Well, there's a little bit of that also because I had this duality to my career where I was a Californian DJ yeah, with DJ my crew. Yeah, you DJ Shadow with your crew. With my crew, yeah. Yeah, so it's like this split personality yeah. of like, who are you in California in this emerging Bay Area scene, which let's not forget was coming off the back of hieroglyphics and had right. its own place in the world. Absolutely. And that's only the most recent success at that moment. There's a long lineage in history before that, granted. But James recognized, to his credit, because as well as being a creative, and we can acknowledge that for sure, given his history now, he was the time was really focused on marketing. 
and he recognized in the UK what this was. I think initially when he started his label, he really wanted to be the next Giles Peterson. And I mean, he's gone on record saying that, that, that that's not a, that's not me. It's not a of. bad thing either. Like talking loud, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, he wanted to DJ like him. And of course, Giles had talking loud and he wanted to do that. So his early, you know, the early Moax records, it's kind of that hipster jazz lettering style and, and that whole thing. But I came into it and I would, in my typical kind of Californian way, I'd be like, I don't really, you know, like, what is all this stuff? This, I, I mean, it, I, I respect it, but it's really not me. I think the term that gets thrown around and primarily in California that we've now become familiar with is, I don't fuck with that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's absolutely how I probably phrased it. I'm, I'm, I'm too used to being in front of a microphone and toning it down, but I, I just tread very lightly when it came to anything other than my own. And, um, like, I didn't want to go out there and be like, nah, that's corny. Uh, it's got to be this way. The only thing I was concerned with was what I was going to be doing. And one of the, one of the first things that I established at Moax was, okay, if everybody's doing, if all of the Moax releases are like a white cover with a particular colorway of lettering and an, a fake OB strip on the side, then my first release is going to be a graffiti picture disc. Like I was going to do the, the polar opposite of everything. In doing so, you dragged Moax into a whole new aesthetic and became a, an integral part of that aesthetic. I'm going to put in, put in that one and come back to that later as well because yeah. that's another great conversation. But focusing on the making of this record right now, um, songs that are just so etched into our lives, anyone who's watching or listening to this, and there's a lot of people who have been moved by this record, you know, did it surprise? Did you feel anything close to how we felt when you first put the piano and the drums together for building steam and recognized that moment? I heard that was life changing for me. Did you listen to it when you were making it and go, Yes, this is me? Yeah, yeah. Um, there wasn't anything on introducing that I was sort of struggling with like is does this feel authentic or or am i you know kind of pushing my own boundaries i will say that there was at one point lyrics to stem and that was my only struggle when i think back to making the record i struggled a lot about whether i wanted to have that part of me represented on this album and on that song because it was deeply personal stuff and I, I just was doing anything that I could to make it personal and make it 100% me. And I had never written lyrics before or tried to put any kind of vocal treatment down. No, I did not sing. Um, but that that was my struggle. And I remember playing it for X from Black Alicious and kind of being like, what do you think? And he kind of gave me his stock like, yeah, man, it's dope. Amazing. Which I knew meant like... No, nah, it ain't dope. It ain't dope. <laughs> uh, well, and also you'd set these deliberate restraints for yourself, these, these, this idea of working within this framework. And I actually think it, as moving as that might have been to hear, it would have aged better than it did in the moment. I think if that album came out and there was one moment where there was this kind of lyrical contribution, I don't know if we would have been able to connect to the to the overall body of work the way that we all did, which was... Everybody was just asking how you did it. And it's not like Paul's Boutique didn't exist. And it's not like people weren't great at sampling records. But it felt like you were conducting, con composing, and constructing everything with a, with a group of players in the room. Like even the way you cut and, 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 and program the bass on building Steam, um, you know, right. or on Changeling. Um, the way that you would wait sometimes three minutes to bring the bass in. You were really thinking like, like a band. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things. I mean, again, I've I've right there in the liner notes, I credit all of my influences, and and the reason being is to say, obviously, there's a lineage here, beyond hip hop culture. There's a lineage of music being made with a sampler, and that's really what I was trying to contribute to, in addition to the broader culture. Because by the mid, you know, from the time I started introducing and or started some of the working tracks till the time it came out, I mean, you had Wu-Tang Clan, which changed the game. You had the Chronic 
came came out, which changed the game. And not only did it change the game, it changed the axis of hip hop culture to the West Coast, yeah. where I grew up. And so, so many things had changed and were changing. And I to to the point where, again, I just was like, I just need to focus on my stuff. Yeah, one of the things I was trying to contribute to was, okay, what haven't people done with a sampler? Well, I, I didn't grow up a jazz student or a, a music student. I didn't grow up a rock kid, but I recognize like, wait, I hear songs on the radio that are in a different time signature. Has anybody ever, anybody ever done that with a sampler or with sample based music? No, cool. I'll try that. Or, or I didn't know, but I didn't know maybe, maybe major force had done it or some other group had done it, but I was like, well, I, I'm not aware of it. I'm going to try that. Um, one of the moments I'm really proud of on that level on the album is the beginning of Napalm Brain drags. It's slower and it pitches up in tempo. I literally program the sequences to slowly rise in tempo the way a band does. And the drummer's kind of a little, the way I program the drums, it's a little bit tentative. It's not quite there yet. And the bass line is a little kind of like, wait, are we locked? We're not quite locked. Let's lock in. And a few bars later, it does lock in. Little things like that, I felt, were for James and I. That's it. You know what I mean? It was it was something I could do to put in there that I hoped James would catch, just like I hoped he wouldn't think Organ Donor was cheesy because I liked it, but I also felt like there was it was so cheeky that I, I was worried he was going to be like, hmm don't know about this one but then later he told me that was the moment on the record where him and uh i think the guy who was managing the label at the time this guy andy just started jumping around together in the like yeah like this okay this is what we were waiting for you know i think we need to at this point just talk a little bit about the dynamic between you and james lavelle if anyone again is ex is experiencing this conversation then you're very familiar with the legacy of Mowax and you know, James has had a really long and, 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 you know, if you look across it, very influential career from the UK beyond. He's, he's had his ups, he's had his downs um, on, a, on a human level, but he's, he continues to be dedicated to the craft of music and what goes into it. Now, this was an essential time in his life and in your life. And I'll just be straight. Like, I just genuinely never knew what was at the core of your relationship together. Well, I mean, I think what you're talking about is the arc of a relationship um, or any kind of relationship, right? And when I first met him in 93, he found an American that knew who Derek B was, that knew who, who London Posse was. Well, the first time you heard me, my voice, you were rocking to the rhythm. <laughs> and his good stuff, finger popping. Yeah, or Asher D and Daddy yeah, Freddie, or, 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 or any, because UK hip hop was something that was finding its way. But again, this is all part of this kind of philosophy that Dave Klein helped instill in me and people like Bambata and, and Flash, where it's like the, the entire globe of music is out there for you to recontextualize, for you to, to consume or metabolize and assign your own kind of hip hop belief structure into. Move it forward. Yeah. Listen, yeah. absorb, adopt, adapt, and move it yeah. forward. Yeah. So what James, I think, found in me was somebody from the States that got it, that wasn't just like, yo, I'm all about just the Bay Area or I'm all about the West Coast or I'm all about just, just you, you know, US based rap. Like you're in the UK to, you know, I didn't have that attitude. And, and in James, what I found was a benefactor. I found, and you know, this goes back hundreds of years. You're, you're a painter, you're struggling you don't understand why anybody wants to mess with you. And then somebody comes along and says, here, I believe in you. Go do what you do. Yeah. And that's all any artist needs. And so for me, I remember the first time I picked James up from the airport, he flew into SFO. I think from LA, actually, because I think Orlando mm -hmm. had flown him into DJ out here. He had a club called Brass. And I think it was, it was only his second time in the States. He came up to see me and I was driving my old busted 77 Cadillac sedan DeVille, he, which, you know, again, he's coming from London and it's like, it's oh, exotic. this is classic. It's exotic. Right? Yeah. yeah. And I just happened to be playing David Axelrod, you know, songs of experience. 
And he was just like, what is this? What is this? This is incredible. Who is this? Where did you find this? Let's go there. Have you heard of this? Have you heard of, uh, heard of this French label? Have you? And so literally the entire, you know, 90 minute drive back to Davis, California, where I lived at the time and where I grew up, it was just that. It was like, check out this tape that Giles gave me. And we were just playing tapes and like rare groove. Tell me about, you know, cause I had heard of the rare groove scene and I didn't really understand what the roots of it was. I know they'd fly people like 45 King out to DJ and I'm like, that's crazy. And it was that intense love of music that bonded us. And when I felt that start to waver within James for other pursuits, yeah, that's when I checked out. Yeah. And it, and that didn't really start happening until... Science fiction. Yeah. It was crazy. It was like this mad sort of strange energy of like, you guys have made this incredible incredible record everything's so dialed in but the band's breaking up mm -hmm. and i just wonder how much that came from the pressure of you going in there making this album introducing being really the break science fiction is collateral damage you're coming off this wave of introducing and it's like you may as well be from the uk you may as well be full-time moax and you're actually supposed to be in California bringing your crew up. You, you've heard that whole Prince thing where it's like, hey, in order for me to win, my whole t yeah. squad has to win, right. whether you're yeah. Madhouse or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's the way I saw it. And with me, Soul Size was one for all. I'll just say that maybe not everybody felt that way. Most of the crew did. Yeah. But I definitely started getting a little bit of like sideways glances, like where are your allegiances? You know what I mean? Yeah. And meanwhile, I'm, you know, recently relocated with my living girlfriend, now wife of all these years. I mean, there's just a lot happening. I, I graduated from college when, you know, when you're in school and you're doing music and you're DJing, you kind of have this, it's almost like being on tour where there's a, a tour manager just telling you what to do and where to go. You have a schedule, you have an itinerary, you kind of have a facilities around you that was all gone you know there's just a million life changes happening and when i delivered introducing and was doing a few dj gigs in in london to kind of start to hype it up whether it was at um the heavenly social and places like that right yeah. places you're supposed to play literally simultaneously to that james was like come on we gotta like he was cracking the whip and, and, and trying to get me to, like, we were working on uncle demos, you know what I mean? So there was really no stopping. And I think in some ways that probably wasn't helpful too, but I was up for it. I mean, I was, I was game for it. I just think that over the course of two years of making science fiction, not fully being able to appreciate what had happened with introducing and then starting to see you know, where like I'm working in the studio, uh, pulling these long hours. And I'm like, where, where the fuck is James? You know what I mean? Like e either we're on the same page and, and we're pulling, you know, this, the same direction or we're not. And that was a very long, it wasn't an overnight thing. It was a long, we were brothers and then, um, and then we weren't. And he sort of decided that there were other, he had aspirations. I mean, he didn't want to sit behind a desk anymore. He wanted to be respected like his artists were respected. But one of the things that I think has always been blown out of proportion is that we hate each other or that, you know, we're at each other's throats or we can't be in the same room. I mean, speaking for myself, I've never felt that. It's so fascinating to, to hear this it, from this perspective because at the time, being a fan of yours, and, and, and coming into your space, you had to be very, very thoughtful, which was tough because you elicited this fandom from people and you must've felt that very mm. much in contrast to who you are as a person, which is like, you're a very chill guy. And yet at the time, it just felt like it was the closest thing to hysteria that someone making sample-based independent and instrumental hip hop music could have faced. I mean, you had such crazy people who were sort of crediting this record and your work as being instrumental, it's it's a very well-known fact that we wouldn't have Airbag 
by Radiohead if it wasn't for introducing. And jo- and Tom has said that over and over again. I mean, that sort of sh- will blow your mind if you're coming straight out of college and trying to figure out where you actually live, let alone where you stand. I think a lot of things. I mean, I think the arrogance of youth. Um, I just think I would hear stuff like that. And number one, I wouldn't really buy it. I'd assume it's a lie <laughs> or a, or just a, an overblown sort of pull quote for an article or whatever. Because I know how... You know, I grew up reading The Enemy and Melody Maker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously this is all pre-internet, pre-social media. I mean, the other thing that I always try to educate people on a little bit when they show an interest is that, I mean, point blank, honestly, my feeling about the release of the album was there was all this buildup. I was doing it for James. I was doing it for myself. I was doing it for this lineage of sample-based music and my heroes trying to honor my heroes. The record came out and then it was like, all right, cool. Go back home. We'll, um, you know, uh, you know, we'll talk about uncle later. So I'm back home in my little, you know, $700 a month flat, like one bedroom flat or whatever in, in quiet little Davis, California, just kind of feeling like, wow, what just happened? And what I found was that I was angry. I felt really angry about so much that I had learned. I mean, I had looked behind the curtain of the music industry. I was good friends with the guy who ran A&M Records, which had uh, taken on Moax in the UK, a guy named Osman. And he revealed things to me about the way that stuff works. And I thought I was ready for it. And in some cases, I don't think I was. And I, I wasn't rich. I wasn't famous. I didn't feel anything other than, wow, I worked really hard on this, put everything I had into it. I have no idea. Nobody around here knows it exists. So it didn't feel real. And for some reason, my response was anger. And so I made a song called High Noon, which was me channeling that anger. Fuck, it's such a classic record that, oh my God, impossible to play in a DJ set, but yes, so fucking yes. incredible. <laughs> All of my be- stuff in that era is impossible to play in a DJ well, set. Well, I mean, like I've seen people do it and, and weave it in beautifully and I've really tried. And But the number song in Organ Donor, they pop. Yeah. But man, you get to High Noon and um, it just makes everything else around it sound a little bit inconsequential because it, it remains to this day, if I may say, to me, the the high watermark for that particular type of sampling and like, I don't know how you made that song. It must have come from raw emotion to your point because it doesn't sound remotely thought, there's any thought process. It, it's just one of those songs that happened really quickly and, and I don't make music in that way anymore in the way that, you know, where I'm like forcing myself to sit down and play records. I, I still do on occasion, um, but I've hopefully added to the, you know, the the palette of techniques. Most definitely. You're much more well-rounded in yeah. terms of the overall idea and of And just the music. idea of, oh, my song should have f- low frequencies and high frequencies. Back then, I just didn't, you know. Yeah. Um, it was all feel. I have never knew the fact that that song was born out of this kind of inbuilt anger and frustration at what you've been exposed to. But then what it's fascinating was because High Noon came quick. Mm-hmm. So we were we were lulled into this false sense of security that like, great, we've all fallen in love with this record. Shadow's just going to keep feeding us. But then after that, I feel like it just be it introducing. That's where I feel you pause and introducing takes over. Mm-hmm. Right. Because the record did start to connect. Yeah. And you did start to be recognized. And I just always felt there was this reluctance to acknowledge that. So which one is it, Josh? Is it anger that no one gives a shit? Or was it frustration that too many people are asking you questions and wanting to touch you? I'll I'll tell you what it is, probably, an inferiority complex. And the reason I say that is, and you know, you can only say stuff like this when you're of a certain age and a, a, a little bit of time. You think time I would have spent. asked you that question 25 years ago? <laughs> I'd have been like, what? You're like, shut up, I'm fucked out of here. Fuck this guy. <laughs> I grew up an outsider. I, I felt like an outsider in this, and that didn't bother me at all. I could care less about what people thought I was. I was pure enthusiasm. So whether that was meeting people like Paris, who was the first person to uh, 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 
really talented, dope artist Incredible. from the Bay Area who put me in the studio and recognized my enthusiasm and my passion for the music. I mean, any of my early mentors, I think what impressed them about what I brought to the table was that enthusiasm. And I, I knew the history of the music. I knew I, I wasn't coming at it. And honestly, I just have to say this. One, I think one of the main differences between introducing and a lot of the music that came out that was inspired by introducing or that people kind of put as like, oh, here's the new DJ Shadow, was that so many of those artists came from other genres, came into hip hop through my music. Mm. And <laughs> that f***ed with me a little bit because I didn't want to be anybody's Fast pass. Fast pass around the culture of hip hop music. Right. And because because ultimately the fear is, is this going to reflect badly on me? Absolutely. Because I ingrain, I love rap. Just because I made an instrumental record doesn't mean like, oh, well, I wanted to do a hip hop record, but without any of that rap. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, a lot of people thought that that's what I had done. Here comes the highbrow kid from California right. who's sitting in the library. He in looks like lessons. a rave kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was poor, not yeah. because I was trying to look like a raver. Yeah. So, so I spent so much time, maybe too much time, trying to contextualize for people. I, I there was just so much at that time where it's like you had to prove yourself. I think having spent a lot of my life talking to artists and at various point had a, a different, different versions of this conversation of like the overcompensation era of like, how do I get people to understand my true intent versus the adoption or the construct that's been placed there upon is, this yeah. project. Yeah. And, and what I've seen from every, every time, including you right now is that that is hell. That is just like exhaustion. I mean, it definitely messed with me for, for quite a while. And then, it's that thing. Honestly, I, I think, you know, it's so funny because I, I, I sat here five minutes ago saying I grew up reading Enemy and in addition to Rolling Stone and stuff. And I know how they can build you up and tear you down. But when the tearing down, be, I just assumed I was anointed. You know what I mean? Because from Jump in the UK, it was like this kid, this kid, like there's a, a end of the year issue of either Melody Maker or Enemy where in the critics' polls, it's like Oasis, Oasis, DJ Shadow, Oasis, Oasis, DJ Shadow, Oasis, DJ Shadow. And I would look at that, and on one level, I could divorce myself from it and be like, oh, that's cool. But on another level, I was kind of like, man, I think I'm set. I think I think I, I did it. You know, I, I got through. It's Look, it's, it's totally understandable to have a temporary out-of-body experience when Tom York is kissing your ass and the enemy are telling you that you're next to Oasis in the single biggest moment of the year. So you are this kind of like alien from outer space, right? Yeah. Davis, California may as well be Mars. Right. But, but the interesting thing from, a, from an outsider's point of view, listening to the album again, is that you intrinsically and instinctively knew what was ahead. It's like you were sending yourself a message with the opening speech on building steam. Have you ever thought about that? Like if you listen to the, to the words of the speech that you sample where it talks about, I made a few mistakes, but I've just, just cleared them up. That's the process, right? And then I still have a long way to go. You know, I'm a student of the drums. I'm also, I'm also a teacher. teacher of the drums. You, you set the whole life up. Like you might freak out about this, but I'm still here learning. I've, I don't have any answers. All of my favorite artists failed on their first failed out of the gate all of them um and some of them are really obscure and you don't know it happened but it did also in that is all of my favorite artists have shown a willingness to stay in class and build and learn and i used to love one of my favorite mcs of all time is guru because recently it occurred to me when we were talking about um i was talking about gab's passing with somebody uh, Gift of Gab from Black Alicious. And it occurred to me that the only MC I had done or, or I had heard come any, anywhere close to that kind of, you know, personal, um, just saying things in a record that are so relatable because they're so specific to him yeah. is Guru. Yeah. And um, th so when I talk about the fact that I love rap and have always loved rap, that's one of the things I've loved. I mean, I learned how to 
on so many levels um, relate to music through rap, to think about the world around me through rap, to understand aspects of myself through rap, because I was growing up, you know, that was the music I was listening to when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, you know, up to, up to today. I, I just think that ultimately when I listen to introducing and, and what you've kind of hinted at that you sense about it, it really was just, um, I think I just, I wanted to contribute so profoundly and I wanted to, I knew that the only way I could do that was to be me, um, you know, hell or high water, good or bad. And it was just interesting. It was interesting the way New York hip hop people related to the record or didn't. It was so interesting the way Bay Area people related to the record or didn't. And I actually always relished the opportunity to have somebody try to pull my card in that era, whether it was a journalist or uh, another artist. I loved, because that's also part of hip hop. Yeah, prove yourself, show yourself. Yeah, Take show it, and prove. No one's gonna give you a seat at the table. Ego Trip had this column called, uh, I think it was Count Chocula. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> and I remember uh, they wanted to interview me. Right. And a friend was like, no dude, it's a setup. Yeah. You can't do it. And I was like, why man? Like, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of this. You know what I mean? I'm not a, I know the culture. I know its history. I know how I fit in, or in some cases don't fit in. I know what my strengths and my weaknesses are. That is the crucial one, is knowing where you don't fit in. That is so important because we assume because we're in the room that we're relatable to everything and everyone all the time. And that's not just in music or in hip hop or in any genre, that's in life. <laughs> that's in life. Oh, I must, I'm a charming, I must be relatable to you. I must be relatable. Mm. Richard Russell said something to me once, which I've always held on to after he said it, I love it. He said, you know, there's something to being thoughtful with your thoughtfulness. And that is really what it's about. It's like, I know my place in this conversation here. I don't know enough over here, so I better just listen. And over here, I'm not interested, so I'm not even going to go there. And also seeing other people do it badly. Um, like, you know, there were, it's, it's really interesting. It, it's also interesting. I remember when I was in Germany, the question I had over and over and over and over on, and it literally almost drove me mad. I mean, after eight hours of being asked this question, it, it, it did mess with me. I mean, the question was over and over, but you are white. And you are in, you, you are doing black music. I, it was almost like, how does this happen? And I just kind of, my response was, look, I, I know where I fit in and don't fit in. And I know that I'm an invited guest at this table. And I know it is not for me to, you know, get all defensive and try to- Assume uh, a position. Yeah, exactly. And and overcompensate, as you said before. So that was something that I was just, it just felt absolutely normal to me because I don't know, I never felt like I missed a lesson. It's not like I, I sort of sprang out of a limo and went, I'm here. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I don't think there's a single thing you could have done in the eighties as far as like college radio, mix show radio, um, interning in a studio, doing sound for a Doors cover band. You know, I don't know if I've ever even talked about this, but the that end of that day in Germany, I was just in a hotel room and coincidentally my wife, or then girlfriend, now wife, was with me. Um, and she was just kind of watching TV at jet lag or something. I remember just laying on my back, looking up at the ceiling and just these faces in the ceiling, just sort of, um, I, I, I can't explain it, you know. Um, it was it was psychedelic and I've never even done psychedelic drugs. Your brain was scrambled. Yeah, it was scrambled and, and uh, I, I'm not trying to sit here like it's any kind of- It's a real experience. It, 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 it <laughs> felt real, yeah, yeah, no, it, it felt you real. It was a real experience. You don't have to justify anything to anybody. Look, I mean, no one truly understands and, and I was there. 
there's a reason why that is that album. There's a reason why we're talking about it 25 years on. That record shook everything up, and I think that it's important to to get to a place now that you uh, you have an incredible career, and you have an incredible family. And by the way, we're still here. Right. Yeah. Congrats, man. Congrats. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how how many times have we have we met and talked over the years? I mean, well into the to the at least twenty. Well, yeah, I was going to say close to thirty, probably. I love the idea of getting to the reality of it because you did, and I give you this compliment, you did an incredible job of presenting your best and protecting the rest. You you laid back and didn't whinge and didn't complain and didn't show how tough it was. I mean, this is a revelation to me. I kind of figured over the years, hinting that it went on. Well, I remember walking down the street in, this, in San Francisco around about, End of end of ninety eight, so two years after introducing came out, and just after Uncle came out, and it was somebody I've, I had known for years, fairly close with, and they had this real joy in proclaiming to me, or, or or you know saying this line. They said, "I'm starting to notice a real backlash against you." Oh, it's so awful! I can't even. It's just so old. It just, I, I was like, hey man, well, what's up? Well, you going to the show or whatever? You know, it was just, we were met on the street, <laughs> walking to the same gig. It's gross. Yeah, I mean, and I hadn't seen him in like a year and he had started to kind of find his way in the industry. And he, he was like, hey man, the first thing he said was like, hey man, oh cool. Oh yeah, I'm starting to notice a real backlash against you. And I just kind of went, well, great. All right, <laughs> I'll see you inside. I mean, I don't, it's just... I, I, I don't know. I, I don't have that in, in me to say not. something like that to somebody. I, and, and I also don't judge them, but it, it, I, I remember in that moment, I was a kind of, dick. <laughs> in the moment, I just kind of went, well, maybe I guess I kind of saw this coming a little bit. And yeah, just like any artist that I followed for decades you have those peaks and you have those valleys. Thank God, because you got to make d bold, creative decisions you could stand by. Surely you can look back now with the body of work that you've created and the fact that you were on the verge of an 18-month tour that got cut short like, like hundreds of others because of quarantine. But to know that there are people waiting to see you again, you can think now, wow, you know, thank God you were actually able to regroup and become the artist you wanted to be and not the artist that we wanted you to be. I say that very deliberately. Right. Yes. And I appreciate that. Um, but there's, there's no roadmap, honestly. And, and, um, you just, I mean, I'm inspired by, um, actors of a certain age, you know, writers of a certain age, there's no guarantees and you don't know where this is all headed. And, and when I say you, I mean me. Or oh, anybody. No. And me. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and I have always, I don't know where it comes from. Maybe it's being a child of divorce. Maybe it's being a product of, I don't know, suburbia in the 70s and 80s. I have no idea where it comes from, but I've just never been able to trust the good times. You know, when you live through stuff like that, as, as all of us have on some levels, um, I do think it made, it, it made me kind of be like, all right. You know, this the pin could drop any day. Yeah, because well, there's two things that come from that in, in my experience, personally and from from conversation. One is that, and I don't know how old you are, but I can guess, probably around the same age as me. You are searching for this sense of security at a time where you're trying to develop your own identity, and it's taken away from you. So nothing is ever safe again, right? It's about survival at that point, right? You may as well as just it be, is now. Yeah, you may as well be at the beginning of time trying to find firewood or you'll freeze to death because you're a cave person. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like right. it's like literally that base of an instinct. Yep. But, but what you also get to do is you get to retreat from the reality of it. And the good news is you get to make introducing and develop a passion and throw yourself so deeply into it that without even realizing it, you become so good people will get attracted to it. The flip side of it is at some point you do therapy and figure out what you left behind when you were 12. You know what I mean? You got to go back and you got to answer those questions at some point. But you got, man, you you found art, right? I, I am always going to defer to those that inspired me. Because, you know, I can meet someone like Premier and be like, um, 
Yo, man, you have no idea. And they, they're going to, you know, they're going to do what I do when people say that to me on the occasion that it happens. I'll be like, oh, cool, cool, cool. Well, so what are you doing? You know, they're not comfortable, like, having anybody put a bunch of stuff on their shoulders about how great they are. I'm not either. Um, and most of the great people that I've met that have inspired me, they have a similar reluctance to acknowledge their impact. And I just think that in, in all, I, I, I can't speak for Premier or Large Professor or whoever, all the people that I've constantly name checked throughout my career as being influences at a pivotal moment for me. But none of us think our best work is behind us. We all think our next project is going to be the best shit we've ever done. And if you don't believe that, get out. I think there's a problem. And that's why, to the extent that I've ever had reluctance to shine the light too brightly on my first record, and some of it I think is a little bit overblown because it all has to do with a particular quote in our magazine that got really overblown. Which one was it again? It, it was basically, you know, imagine you and I chopping it up and we're having a good old time and we're playing music and you say to me, um, well, what, what do you think people who love introducing are going to say about this new record, which was The Outsider? I, in a moment of sort of unguarded... Uh, swag. I'm feeling good. Yeah, unguarded swag was like, f*** them. They already have introducing. Which, by the way... Oh, hang on. That has been repurposed and used in different ways mm -hmm. by so many artists. Right. You have to feel that way on a certain level. And you're not saying, fuck my fans. You're saying, well, you my fans roll with me. No, 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 no. Here's the difference. Technically. Here, uh, here, here, here's the difference. Then. Here's the difference. <laughs> I considered and still consider my fans who I appreciate immensely. Um, and respect. I still consider my fans to be fans of the journey. There's a lot of people out there who are fans of the album. And that was it. They weren't there before and they weren't there after. It was that album. And I can't control the mechanism of the way something clicks with the general public but there's a lot of moving parts, none of which have to do with me or very few. Yeah. So I recognized that early on and, and said, okay, there's going to be people that for them, their preference would be that I make that record disappear and never, never show my face again, because that's how much they love that record. Any word out of my mouth is like nails on a chalkboard to them because it tampers with their memories of what that record is to them. I get it. I totally get it. But with all due respect to those people, I still, I'm not done. I, 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 it was, it was, I cooked one meal. Yeah. That's what I mean. You, you became know what I mean? the artist. They loved that meal. You, you became the artist you wanted to be, not the artist everyone else wanted you to be. Right. And that's. And over time, my quote unquote real fans understood that. And, and I knew that at a certain point, I just needed to shut up and write it out. And it took probably, I don't know, six, seven, eight years, I feel like. Um, and that's not unusual either in the arc of this artist or that artist. And I'm not trying to compare myself to anybody else, but uh, I study from those people. And I, I, I'm always so grateful that they're there because I can look at, at somebody I name check constantly is someone like Neil Young, who again, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you can look and be like, yeah, people really weren't feeling him for this stretch. And yeah, he probably was a little bit too uh, influenced by this and kind of, but you, one thing I would never personally say to an, any artist is you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't have done that. You know what I mean? Who could ever say that? Like, not everything is going to be a hit. Not everything is going to be, is going to connect. You know, uh, the general public is more or less a straight wave. And I find that I tend to be like this. You know what I mean? Well, I actually think that that's a tipping point into what you've become. 
and people trying to respect the fact that they like your new shit. Yeah. So they're like, I just want you to know I'm not just, you're not just the introducing guy anymore. And I get that. Yeah. I get that they're, I get that that's why they're doing it. It, it does make me sometimes wonder though, because I mean, again, in this brave new world we're living in, um, Sometimes I think to myself after an interview, like, damn, I really should check out my Wikipedia page because the <laughs> questions were asked in a particular sequence that was exactly like the questions asked in a particular sequence in the prior interview. Right. And I mean, that's what people do. If you want to learn about an artist, you, you, you go there or another similar resource. And if something's in there that's a little off or a little like maybe embellished or something you're going to have to answer to that forever i mean that's one of the beautiful things about this conversation is um i'm so excited to have it because we talk all the time whenever you re release music and sometimes even when you don't we, we connect and we speak and i and i cherish that me too man thank you but but this i knew was going to be like all right let's just pull it open because there was still so much i didn't know about that time it was a magical time yeah I mean, for you to arrive in the UK with a record like that on the verge of this new labor promise that ultimately turned out to be what it was, but at the time was this glorious, magical, the UK is going to lead the way in this new liberal Wonka factory. It's going to be fucking wonderful. Yeah. And you show up and then Oasis, it's like Nebworth and Radiohead have just dropped OK Computer. And the whole thing just feels like wild. There was an optimism that, if you weren't there in the UK at the time, it's hard to describe. It's hard to understand. And um, yeah, for us, like, and of course it was our age. It was our time, right? I mean, it's like, oh, Mike D's in town. He wants to go to Wagamama. Let's, uh, okay, cool. And we're like walking in and the entire restaurant's turning around to look at us in our, in our bathing ape, yeah. you know, parkas <laughs> and our, you know, it was like we were the cool kids. And I have to say, I never felt like the cool kid. I was just watching James and everybody else that was around his clique. That's what made you cooler. It's like the worst part about it. Well, whatever it was, I, I just, you know, when you're a particular age and you're, you're making a mark, I mean, there's no greater feeling. I, I mean, I will always love that time. I'll always love the feeling of, you know, James was always living in these above his pay grade kind of like, really nicely adorned flats with like a little garden out back. And then I'd, I'd just put my backpack on and go to the tube and you go wherever to meet with wherever or be at the studio or do this or be there for that interview. And yeah, man, it was, it was incredible. It was the, and people would, would always kind of ask about, they would try to bring up Hendrix as one of the only other, Americans. Like there was a similarity in yeah. this, in the arc at that time. Yeah. And obviously I'm, again, not comparing on any level, but it was, there is an element of it that was already romantic to me just from knowing his career. The album dropped and, and had kind of immediate, it, it made a wave in the UK. And then it felt like about six months later, that wave came back to the States and everybody assumed I was English Everybody assumed this, assumed that. And and there was an element of that that was fun, that nobody really knew what, who I was, what I was. I, I, the, the one part I can't really reconcile is, in my mind, um, at the time, it seemed like when, whenever people would talk about, well, like, it's, it's, it stands alone, there's nothing else like it. And I would kind of go, well... Yeah, there is. I mean, Mantronics, you know, King of the Beats, like that set it off. And then the, there's been instrumental hip hop forever, you know. But again, there's that duality of like kind of musicologist and, and being able to look at my own stuff from an outside perspective. I mean, I, I honestly don't know where certain aspects of it came from. No, but, but, but I mean, you know, you are a vessel and every artist is a vessel and, and, you know, you catch lightning and, and, and why would you sit down and, 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 and turn that into a, into an equation? Exactly. Yeah. And, and that respecting that frequency that, that, um, which I, 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 I love the concept of, I, I really hope it exists, but, um, that, you know, jazz artists have talked about forever about the, the kind of God frequency where 
artistic inspiration lives and you have to kind of have a calmness of mind to be able to access and a, and an openness of heart to access. I love that. And, um, I guess one of the reasons I, if I ever have come across as defensive about anything relating to unpleasant aspects of my career, it's because I haven't wanted to taint that openness or damage my ability to be at peace with all the decisions I've made. Because I want, again, in 2021 or 2022 to be able to sit down and be able to access that, that ancestor voice that speaks to all artists, you know what I mean? And the, you can feel when it's not accessible and you can feel when it's, you, you don't have the passcode and you can't get through and you don't, you know, the, the clouds and the, the rays from the sun are not conducive to you receiving that frequency. You can feel it. And when I sit down to work and that happens, that'll instantly put you in check every time because you, that's, that's not a good sign, buddy. Like you got to get back to wherever, you know, that, that humility or, or whatever it is that you haven't been doing enough of to get to find that frequency because it's addicting and it's powerful.